Great, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's my privilege to be here. Um, so why, why a selection of results? Um, well, there has been recently like this, like a growing attention in, in machine learning in pretty much every field from, uh, from uh, all companies to astrophysics to biology. So everyone thinks this is very sexy and uh, is putting some attention to it. And, um, and of course, physicists uh, uh, did the same. And uh, in the last uh, few years, I would say really five years, there has been like tons of new papers on, on the, at the intersection of machine learning and physics. And uh, it's still very unclear uh, what these techniques can give to physics and what can physics give back to machine learning. And, uh, and together with my collaborators, we have been trying to, to explore some of these questions. And uh, we have found that uh, there is great value in, 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 answer, in trying to answer different questions. Um, and, uh, and so what I would like uh, to offer you today is, uh, is a bit of a survey of the, of the things we have been seeing. And, uh, and hopefully uh, these uh, insights uh, will come to you as well. Um, so I'm not quite sure it's now really necessary to make these introductory slides on machine learning. It's like introduction to thermodynamics, but it will be very brief. Uh, machine learning is a set of um, uh, statistical and algorithmic techniques uh, for analyzing data. There are three main flavors of machine learning. Uh, there is supervised, uh, where you're trying essentially to approximate a function from labeled examples. There is unsupervised learning, where you're trying to make inference on an unlabeled uh, uh, data set. And there is reinforcement learning, where there is, uh, you're trying to optimize the action of an agent that is interacting with an environment. And, um, and what about machine learning and physics? Uh, well, um, there are already some successful applications. Uh, one that came out recently in Chaos, uh, uh, analyzing data to the LHC. And uh, there are also some interesting stuff on quantum antibody physics that we will um, cover. And uh, one very interesting question, at least for me, is can we do theory-less science? And um, maybe it's more of a question for philosophers, but I think it's uh, interesting to, to ask, uh, yeah, can we drop equations and just uh, ask algorithms to do science for us? Um, so with that, uh, like a brief overview of what we'll see today. Part one is, uh, is about understanding what it means to learn a quantum state and when can we do that efficiently. Uh, part two is instead interested in understanding um, can we accelerate machine learning algorithms using a quantum computer? And these two parts go some, somehow together because they're ba both the, in the framework of this very formal model of learning called the, the probably approximately correct model that is nice because you can prove many things and is not nice because uh, the things that you can prove don't mean anything to the people that are really using machine learning or close to, to anything. Um, then uh, part three, a bit of interchange of mathematical techniques between the two fields, actually mostly importing techniques from machine learning in quantum information. And part four is about modeling uh, uh, quantum antibody physics with neural networks. Um, so this, it's a survey, so we'll, we'll have to pay a price for this in the sense that uh, we won't be able to go very much into the proofs and, uh, and I, I apologize for that. So part one, so the questions we're trying to ask here is wh which quantum states are efficiently learnable and what it means to learn? I will start with a brief introduction of this uh, uh, formal model of supervised learning. So here we have um, uh, a function that is unknown and it's part of a class of function C. And we want to approximate this function using uh, labeled examples. So x uh, pairs x f of x. And these examples are given uh, or distributed randomly according to a probability distribution. And this model was developed by Leslie Valiant in the 80s. Um, so what are the ingredients of this model? So we have uh, uh, like a parameter epsilon that is, that is modeling the approximation. 
So what um, uh, our estimates don't need to be um, as close, I mean, can be close to f of x and don't need to be exactly f of x. Uh, we have a confidence parameter that is modeling the high probability. And so it is, I mean, it's trying to model the fact that we can be very unlucky with our training set and just getting samples that are not really representative of the underlying distribution. So we want some sort of failure parameter. And then we need to introduce this example oracle, that is uh, uh, this oracle that returns a sample x f of x according to the probability distribution d of x. Um, so what it means to learn in this setting? Um, well, the learnability is really about like a set of functions that are pack learnable if for every function in, in this set and for every probability distribution. So this is called a, a distribution-free setting. Um, for our epsilon and delta parameters, there is a learning algorithm A that has access to the oracle. And with probability one minus delta, returns an hypothesis uh, that is uh, uh, wrong not very often. So what is important to note here is the fact that is not wrong very often is measured according to the distribution D that is giving you the training set. And in a way, this is really modeling um, some sort of um, uh, intuition of induction. So you will not be able to predict things uh, that uh, you have not seen. Um, so how do we model the efficiency of a learner? There are two quantities, one that is more information theoretic, the other one that is more computational. The first one is the sample complexity and is the minimum number of examples that the learner must see before can learn the, the class. And there is one computational that instead is uh, what's the best uh, runtime for a learner of that class. And only in that case we have, uh, we can say that uh, a class is efficiently pack learnable. And this difference between um, only pack learnable or efficiently pack learnable will be important for quantum states. Um, so strengths and weaknesses of this model. Weaknesses first. Um, so, I mean, it is uh, this distribution free setting is, uh, is, is, I mean, it's very broad, but then can't quite match what we see in reality because um, in reality, what we see is that many things are effectively learnable. So the, the question of why neural networks work so well is really not well captured by this model where pretty much everything is very hard and it's provably hard. And uh, so it's a model that is interesting to start to get your bearings around learning, but then uh, it's probably too limited for, for the practical learning setting. And um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to model the true data distribution. And also when you're asked uh, to measure the performance of your algorithm, you might not have the same distribution. So the assumption that the D gives you the training set and the test set might not be true. But what are the strengths? Well, as I said, we can prove many things, both from the statistical and computational side in this model. And I think this is very interesting uh, in the context of uh, quantum computation and quantum information where we like to prove things and we, don't, we still don't have a quantum computer where we can test uh, uh, whether all our algorithms work. And, um, well, I mean, intuitions that came from learning theory actually had some uh, real life applications, for example, boosting, support vector machines, all came from kind of very, very theoretical considerations in, in this kind of, uh, of setting. Uh, so coming to the um, quantum world. So what it means to pack learn a quantum state. So all this um, setting was developed by Scott Aronson in a 2006 paper that appeared in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. And um, here we have an n-qubit quantum state. It can be mixed, it can be whatever you like. And uh, we have training examples that are measurement on the state, uh, are actually two outcome PLV measurements on the state. And the function you're trying to learn is uh, expected uh, a value of uh, measurements on the state. So what are the inputs to our problem? So we have um, the ER is a two outcome PLVM. We have a distribution over PLVM measurements. 
And we have a training set of POVM measurements distributed according to, to D. And well, of course, we have a quantum state. And uh, what, what do we want? Well, we want to output an hypothesis, um, a sigma, that can approximate without, prob without probability a new measurement, uh, the, the expected value of a new measurement, also drawn from D. Um, so what Aronson, oh, interesting, that uh, um, this is a setting that recall quantum state tomography, but it, it, is, it is very different. And indeed the results we will, we're going to see, it is a very powerful result, but uh, um, it requires some care because uh, this, this, um, the fact that we are learning under a distribution make the model, uh, make the model weaker than, than tomography, where what we ask is that we can predict uh, uh, any, any measurement outcome on the state. So what um, uh, Aronson proved um, is that in this setting, uh, uh, the concept class of quantum states, um, so essentially, if we go back, is the set of functions q, rho, e, where rho is essentially parameterizing the class, um, is pack learnable. So what this means um, is that uh, the sample complexity of uh, learning this, uh, um, this, this concept class uh, is polynomial. So in a way, this... Um, in, in the equation that you can see in red, you have that the, the m depends only linearly in, in the number of qubits. Uh, and this is very um, um, counterintuitive, if you want, because, uh, well, we know that a quantum state, like the state vector, is, uh, uh, it re requires 2 to the n different parameters. Well, here we have that if we only see uh, a linearly scaling, a linearly growing uh, subset of measurements, or if you want uh, linearly many copies of the state, uh, we can still learn the state uh, in this very precise uh, sense uh, defined by, by pack learning. And this is a result that definitely, I mean, baffled the community at first because uh, probably there was some confusion with uh, how this result related to state tomography. And, and yeah, I think it's very important to clarify that the, the two settings are different. And this is not saying that tomography can be done with um, um, polynomially many copies of the state. Um, but uh, what is, I think, very interesting is uh, this, this result, this theorem, does not say what is the computational cost uh, of, uh, of generating this hypothesis. And, uh, and the computational cost of generating the hypothesis uh, is... Uh, is, uh, is something that is related to this uh, SPD, S, uh, SDP uh, that you see in red. So basically, uh, a good hypothesis is any hypothesis uh, that uh, satisfies uh, all the predictions uh, that are already contained in a training set, because uh, um, all the inequalities uh, run for all the elements of the training set. So basically, your hypothesis must predict uh, as well, approximately well, as uh, um, the measurements that you have in your training set. And then your hypothesis must be uh, a valid quantum state. It's, it's really something, I mean, um, quite simple, the, the requirement for an hypothesis that generalize, uh, will generalize well. And what is interesting is that, well, I mean, we have uh, um, efficient algorithms for solving this program, um, but unfortunately they're efficient in the dimension of the matrix sigma that, that is exponential. So the, the, the actual complexity of the problem grows exponentially. So even if the information is there, we, we cannot extract it. So a little digression, I mean, um, we, we, we teamed up with, a, with an experimentalist, with a team of experimentalists in Rome led by uh, Fabio Cerrino. And, uh, and uh, well, we, we, we tried to do a little demonstration of this theorem. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, it's a theorem, so it uh, has to work. And, but indeed, we, we verified experimentally that uh, uh, these scalings actually occurs. Um, so coming back with the implications of the theorem, yeah, the theorem um, well, no, no free lunch. Uh, why I was saying that Learning quantum state is equivalent to solving an SDP, and SDP can be solved efficiently in the dimension of sigma, uh, but the dimension of sigma scales exponentially. 
So the question is, are there special classes of quantum states uh, for which the uh, learning problem is solvable in polynomial time? And, uh, and this is uh, something that uh, I've been thinking on for a while, and it's, it's still going. There is uh, uh, one result already, and it's uh, uh, the pack learnability of stabilizer states. So uh, w w what is a stabilizer state? Um, well, it's, it's um, a quantum state, psi, is stabilized by um, an operator p, if, um, uh, and p is, uh, is an element of the Pauli group, p, uh, n. If p applied to psi lives the state uh, invariant. So psi is an eigenstate uh, of, with eigenvalue one uh, of uh, the operator p. And uh, a stabilizer state uh, is a state that is stabilized by a subgroup S uh, of the Pauli group. Um, so what we have here is that these particular quantum states uh, um, admit an efficient representation because one can just uh, list the generators of the group and, uh, and, and that will suffice to give uh, a good description of the state. And um, so what, what we proved uh, is that um, uh, stabilizer states are efficiently packed learnable. So for these particular class uh, of, uh, of quantum states, uh, um, the, tr the training set uh, grows only linearly, but uh, we can use uh, this information in an efficient way to make predictions on the state. So how do we do that? I I'll try to sketch a proof, uh, the proof that is, that is very simple. And uh, so the idea consists in identifying the, the generators uh, of the state that are contained in a training set. And, uh, and basically constructed state uh, that uh, exploit uh, um, all the, um, the information contained in the generators. So this sum is basically running with, uh, um, on all the combinations uh, of uh, products of different elements of the generators. Well, what is interesting about the state that is written here is that uh, if you want to write down the full state, uh, you still need exponentially many elements. So if you only wanted to list, uh, to write down the state would still be very inefficient, the algorithm. So the idea of what it is, is uh, exploiting all the, the algebraic properties of stabilizer to essentially make prediction on sigma without actually never writing down the full state. And, uh, and how can you do that? Well, basically all you have to do is whenever you want to predict the outcome of a new measurement, you check the commutators between this new measurement uh, and the generators, and you check whether the state is generated by the generators. And with this information, uh, plus some little tricks uh, that determines the sign, because you can have a stabilizer and an anti-stabilizer, you, you can predict the outcome of, uh, of a new measurement. Um, now, what is interesting about stabilizer states is that they're known to be, so stabilizer computation is known to be efficiently classically simulatable. So it's a type of computation, quantum computation, that can be performed efficiently by a classical computer. So a very important open question is trying to understand whether we can relate uh, states uh, that can be learned efficiently with quantum, with, with states that can be produced by a quantum circuit that is efficiently classically simulatable. And, um, and uh, another interesting question is to understand how these results extend to quantum channels. So it's something more in the sp spirit of process tomography. And, uh, and finally, what is the learnability of other quantum quantities like entanglement entropy? What is the sample, com sample complexity and time complexity of, this, uh, um, of these other quantities? So with that, to conclude part one, and I go to part two, where instead I focus more on uh, can we learn faster with a quantum computer? So this is a joint work with um, uh, Simone Severini at UCL and Vroon Canade at Oxford. Mm, so now the problem we're discussing is, so we're trying to learn a classical function with quantum resources. So the PACT model extends to the quantum world, and this extension was made in 1998 by Prudian Jackson, two learning theorists. 
And uh, so the ingredients are quite simple. We only have that the learning algorithm is quantum. And we have that our example oracle turns into a quantum example oracle. So the quantum example oracle returns a superposition of, of, of the entire training set. Uh, as you can see, I mean, this is a very uh, sophisticated object. It's really, I mean, questionable whether these things can really be uh, produced. And indeed, this is one of the, the limitations of this model. Um, what we know in this model, so one thing, the first one is extremely interesting. And in terms of sample complexity, so how many samples the algorithm needs to see, and this is equivalent to how many times you have to query the quantum example oracle. In, in that case, you only have a constant advantage uh, uh, over classical uh, learners. And this is a result that was proved uh, two years ago by Arunushalam and De Wolf. And instead, what is interesting is also that there are possible advantages in terms of time complexity. So, well, in theory, we can go faster. We, we have no no-gum theorems that say, no, you can't go faster. And, uh, and there is a, a very nice review that came out again last year, uh, also by Arunushalam and De Wolf, that I warmly encourage you to have a look at. Um, so here we are concerned about learnability of Boolean functions. So PAC has mainly been concerned with, with Boolean functions. And uh, in particular, um, one of the long-standing open questions in the, PAC model, in the PAC model is the learnability of Boolean function that can be written in disjunctive normal forms. So a, a DNF, um, what it is, is a disjunction of terms, where each term is a conjunction of Boolean literals or or is negation, and the size of a DNF, uh, S is the number of his conjunctions. So I'll give you a quick example here, and I'll try to argue why these things are, are very important and why it's still uh, one of the kind of big open questions in, in learning theories, can we learn uh, this DNF efficiently or not? And they are important because, uh, well, uh, concepts in DNF form seems to be very, I mean, easy to understand for humans. So it's something that we can grasp very well, and uh, it seems easy for us to, to, to understand well. For example, do you want a mango, an apple, or a carrot, uh, or a, and a salary? And this is not true for, for many other concepts, like uh, the exclusive or. And, and what uh, has been really puzzling for many is that, um, although intuitively seems, they seem very easy, we can't really prove that they can be learned uh, efficiently. And, and, and most likely, they're, they're not sufficiently learnable. Um, so, I mean, I'll go through a bit of the literature on DNF. So the best classical algorithms after almost 20 years of work is still an exponential algorithm. And this is an algorithm that uh, viewed by Quibens and Servadio that uh, it's, works in a distribution-free setting. Um, but, um, well, at some point, people uh, started to, to to say, well, then maybe the distribution free setting is too, is too restrictive. Why don't we try to, try to think about um, learnability under specific distributions? And, and indeed, uh, under product distribution, uh, you get a much better scaling. Uh, still not, not polynomial, is uh, was it polynomial or super exponential? And, and this is quite interesting for us uh, because uh, the algorithm we, we propose is a quantum algorithm that that in a way beats, the, beats these classical algorithms. It goes from super polynomial to, to polynomial. And um, another thing you can do to make things more, more efficient uh, is to make your learner more powerful. So uh, other than, the, than having access to the example oracle, you have this little cheat oracle called the membership query. And you can ask the membership query oracle, what's the value of uh, uh, f uh, at, at a point x? So if uh, your learner has access to this more powerful oracle, then, uh, well, things uh, become efficient, again, only under product distributions. And what is very interesting is that there is this, like, quantums, quantum learnability seems in between uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, super polynomial without uh, any further help uh, and something that uh, instead is polynomial, but uh, you need to give the learner some help. And, um, and in the quantum pack model, uh, what we know is that uh, um, 
the, the best learner is, uh, runs in polynomial time. And this is a result by, again, Prudy and Jackson. And uh, so what we did um, was extending this work and proving rigorous bounds on, uh, I mean, the computational resources that we need. Uh, and, and we extended the result to a, a more general class of distributions, that is, product distributions. Um, so um, I'll try to give you an intuition of how the learnability of the FNFs in the classical setting works. So it really exploits uh, as many learning theory algorithms the concentration of the Fourier spectrum of the function. So basically you can prove that if you can uh, produce a function that approximates well the Fourier spectrum of your function, then uh, you're assured uh, that this function will be a good learner for, for f. So the task uh, really becomes uh, the task of producing a g whose Fourier spectrum is close to f. And, um, and uh, the key ingredient here is the Fourier spectrum of your function f that you want to learn. So a very important thing that you have to do is uh, get this Fourier spectrum. And the only way to do that thing efficiently in the classical world is to use this Kushilevitz Mansur algorithm that unfortunately requires membership queries. And, uh, and really, the quantum results, uh, um, all it does uh, is to say, wait, in the quantum world, we don't need membership queries to get uh, efficiently the Fourier spectrum of a function. And uh, here, I mean, we're using the assumption that Fourier spectrum is, is, is concentrated. And, uh, and we can do that uh, uh, with quantum resources efficiently. So basically, this work was really uh, proving uh, um, a quantum version uh, of the extended version of the cushy levitz mansur algorithm. So uh, a version of the algorithm that works uh, under product distributions. So in order to do that, um, uh, I'll briefly define what is a product distribution. Uh, we had to introduce a new ingredient that is a, Fourier transform, a quantum Fourier transformed defined over the weighted Boolean cube. And that's, well, I mean, we call that the mu bias Fourier transform, quantum Fourier transform. And um, we had to introduce mu bias quantum Fourier sampling. I won't go through that because it's really kind of a trivial extension of the standard quantum Fourier sampling result. And then uh, we had to bound uh, the numbers of ex examples needed to estimate uh, probability distribution in infinity norm. And that was uh, well, basically quite, quite a trivial application of this uh, concentration inequality. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go through that as well. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just present this quantum AKM algorithm. So what is a product distribution? So a product distribution over the Boolean cube uh, is characterized by a real vector mu and is a distribution uh, that factorizes uh, over uh, the different elements of your bit string. And uh, so you can think of that as uh, the product of many uh, yeah, uniform distribution over the bit string. And uh, the expected value of, uh, of an element of the bit string is mu i. And when the vector mu is zero, then it reduces to the uniform distribution. So this is really like a generalization of the product distribution, of the uniform distribution. So what is very nice is that in this setting, um, the usual free analysis um, generalizes very well. Um, so if you have this weighted Boolean cube, you can define uh, uh, a new uh, inner product that is, uh, yes, this guy here. Um, that it's a weighted inner product. And uh, you can uh, show the analytical form uh, of a orthonormal basis for this, uh, um, for this um, uh, new inner product. And, um, and then you can extend all the standard results of free analysis uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this weighted space. And, uh, and basically what we want to, to, to do is uh, sample from the Fourier coefficients uh, defined in this uh, mu biased setting. Uh, so we had to come up with a quantum version of this transform. Uh, so here, 
um, we started from the single qubit transform. And uh, that was quite straightforward. Actually, the whole thing is very straightforward. Because for, for the single case, well, we just uh, wrote down the, the, the transform. Great, I mean, it's easy to check that this guy is, unit, is, a, is a unitary matrix. Uh, uh, fine, you can implement that on a quantum computer because I mean, any um, single gate rotation can be uh, implemented out of a discrete set of gates with, uh, with a logarithmic overhead. And uh, how do we go to the n qubit case? Um, well, here we exploit a key property of this uh, distribution, and that is uh, that, uh, um, that D, that the, the distribution and the basis can be factorized. So basically, we can write the n qubit transform by simply taking the tensor product uh, of many single qubit transforms. Um, and all the usual results uh, of uh, um, quantum free sampling generalizes uh, trivially to this case. So finally, what we were able to do uh, after a bit of uh, um, um, well, mathematical lifting on, on the bounds, on the error bounds, is to come up with this quantum algorithm that takes uh, um, uh, a function f and, uh, and has access to, fun to this function with a quantum example oracle. And if one has access to this uh, quantum example oracle that queries a polynomial number of time, uh, one can estimate, so can produce uh, a Saxon representation of the state uh, um, in, uh, in, in polynomial time. And uh, th this approximation is, is good in, in infinity norm, and so that's why we, used, uh, we needed this result uh, that uh, estimates how many samples you need to approximate a probability distribution in, in infinity norm. And with that, well, it's really straightforward to apply the quantum AKM algorithm to the standard algorithm that I presented before by Feldman and obtain that this DNF formula are efficiently quantum pack learnable under the product distributions. Um, so what are the open questions in this model? Um, so one thing that I was mentioning before is that this uh, these uh, quantum example oracles are very exotic objects. So one way to build them is with this uh, um, very exotic object as well, the quantum random access memory. And there is a big discussion going on on can we really build the, that, uh, that, that device? Uh, so leaving that question aside is, can we obtain uh, quantum speedups in learning problems that don't use uh, like a training set in superposition? And uh, Maybe we can, and, uh, and for example, Servetti and Gortler, Gortler uh, came up with, uh, with a learning problem whose hardness is based uh, on the hardness of uh, factoring integers, something that we know it's hard for uh, classical computers, or at least it's conjectured to be hard. And uh, with quantum computers, we should be able to do that efficiently. And, uh, and so that learning problem becomes efficient uh, in, in, in the quantum world, and you don't need a quantum example oracle. And another very fascinating problem uh, is the following, is the learnability of AC0 circuits. Um, so these are constant depth circuits. And what is interesting here is, again, the best classical algorithm is uh, super polynomial, and we're again exploiting the concentration of the Fourier spectrum. But surprisingly, we have a, a super polynomial lower bound. So it looks like, oh, we're screwed. But uh, what is super interesting is that the bound, uh, the lower bound, is based on the hardness of factoring. So maybe we can uh, uh, find a clever way, quantum way, to get around that, that obstacle. Um, part three. Now we talk about interchange of mathematical techniques. And, uh, and here, the question we ask is, are there other ways of uh, classically simulating quantum evolutions? So this work was a collaboration with uh, uh, Alessandro Rudi at the Ecole Normale and uh, in Ria, Carlo Ciliberto at UCL, Leonard as well at UCL, Massimiliano Pontil that is both at UCL and the IIT the Italian Institute of Technology, and Simone Severin at a UCL. That is a UCL. Um, so here we talk about a classical simulation of time-independent quantum Hamiltonians. So we know that uh, in general, strong quantum simulation, where by strong I mean 
that the output of your simulation is uh, uh, the full state vector is uh, a sharp p hard problem. So this is even harder than NP. Is a, is a counting problem. And uh, so it is a tough problem. Uh, this is not quite what quantum computers are solving because, I mean, quantum computers can only sample from the output state. Uh, but, well, it's, we don't really know how hard is the, the, the problem that quantum computers are solving. So let's stick to what we know. And the general case is really hard. And we really have two different methods for, for, for finding solutions to this problem. We had to have stochastic approaches that uh, like quantum Monte Carlo um, that uh, I mean use this probabilistic framework and are efficient for Hamiltonians that are uh, free, free of the sign problem. Um, and then we have um, uh, compression approaches. I'm not really sure if this is the right word, but they rely on, um, on an efficient representation of the wave function. And in the case of tensor networks, we are, we're exploiting the, the entanglement structure of the state. And so one, one extra question that we, we thought was interesting and some tools of coming from machine learning, or better coming from machine learning, coming from physics, uh, that for a long time, resuscitated by machine learning, brought back to physics, uh, kind of helped to, to, to answer. And, uh, and we talk about the literature on, on um, randomized linear algebra and, and in particular about random projections and an evolution of random projections, that is the Nistrom method. Um, so I'll sketch you what, what, it, what it is a random projection. It's, it's basically a linear, random linear transformation that can be used uh, for dimensionality reduction. And, uh, and the key result here is the johnson lennon strauss lemma. Uh, so here what we have is um, uh, is a vector x, and we want to, I mean, reduce the dimension of x, uh, and this is part of a finite set of vectors in, in RD. We have some, um, like, an error parameter delta that is uh, modeling in a similar way uh, the, well, the possibility that our random projection is a very unlucky one. And uh, we have an error parameter epsilon that depends on uh, the size of the set Q and delta and, 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 and one over n. And we have that we probably at least one minus delta over a choice of a random matrix W uh, that is uh, whose entries are drawn from a Gaussian distribution. Uh, we have that uh, uh, the, 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 so you should think of X as the difference between two vectors, so X2 and X1. So we have that uh, uh, the approximation that, that we make uh, uh, can be made small uh, by using uh, a, a, a random matrix. And, uh, and basically, the Nistrom methods uh, uh, kind of develops this idea and, uh, and, and uses random projection to, to construct a low rank uh, symmetric approximation of the matrix. And, uh, and people in machine learning are constantly need to shrink dimension of these huge data sets uh, or, I mean, uh, quite interested in these type, types of techniques. Um, so we applied this Nistrom method to the problem of uh, approximating uh, um, Hamil um, exponential of uh, Hermitian matrices. That, uh, well, that's uh, uh, what we want to do when we're trying to simulate this, the, the evolution of a time-independent uh, quantum Hamiltonians. Um, but in order to have this method working and to have an efficient algorithm, we, we have a few requirements on H. So the first one, we want H to be row computable. So basically, this is a sparsity requirement, uh, and uh, we want the most uh, polylog n non-zero entries uh, in a row, and we need to basically have a list uh, with these entries uh, for. So we need an oracle that I can query, say, tell me all the non-zero uh, entries in row S. Then we need a more sophisticated assumption: is row searchability. And this means that for, for each row, we need to be able to, to sample efficiently on, on these non-zero entries. And, uh, and finally, we have a condition uh, on, the, on the Frobenius norm of the matrix. So if the Frobenius norm squared minus 1 over 2n of the trace squared of, apologies, there should, there should be the trace of h. So it's the trace of h squared uh, is less than polylog n uh, than our simulation is efficient. So I know this is not a tremendously intuitive condition. Um, 
and uh, we kind of found uh, I mean, a hammer and we were like looking for a nail and uh, and uh, and what we found uh, is that uh, this method works uh, well for approximate uh, um, uh, uh, Hamiltonian dynamics sorry I just uh, so I'll go through what the algorithm does before giving you where it can be used uh, so it takes an input, a dis an efficient description of an Hamiltonian. So, if uh, the description you have is uh, uh, like a huge matrix to n by two to the n, uh, and this is like the algorithm won't be efficient. So, you need an efficient description of your Hamiltonian, um, and an efficient description of your initial quantum state. Uh, and what it outputs is an efficient description of the state. So, what we're basically outputting is an implicit description of the output state. So you tell me, I want entry i of the output state, I'll give you that. Um, so note, here we're tackling a harder problem uh, uh, than the one solved by quantum computers, uh, which can uh, uh, only sample from the state. We can actually output the entry, and this is pretty much what uh, strong quantum simulation does. And yeah, our theorem says that if h is row computable, row searchable, uh, and respects that condition, Again, the trace uh, should have an Hamiltonian in. Uh, then we can efficiently compute an approximation of the evolution. So application, as uh, the application we were able to find is sample-based Hamiltonian simulation. So this is a technique that was developed by uh, Lloyd, Rabentrust, and Mazzani for studying uh, uh, probabilistic component analysis in a quantum setting. It's basically what you want uh, is to simulate the evolution, yeah, an Hamiltonian evolution where the Hamiltonian is a, is a density matrix. And uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, simulation has application in, in many machine learning algorithms, quantum machine learning algorithms, for example, the one for linear regression or support, or support vector machine. So in that case, um, we have that, well, basically we have uh, uh, a bounded, uh, um, so the, the trace of the matrix is one, and our uh, condition for Frobenius norm is respected, and uh, and uh, and we can perform that that simulation efficiently. Uh, I know this is not a tremendously exciting application, uh, and uh, so one question is: Can we identify identify uh, more physical Hamiltonians that respect this constraint? And uh, but. Uh, um, Another important question is uh, if uh, we tailor the algorithms to solve the problem of weak quantum simulation, can we relax the assumption of the Frobenius norm? And in general, I mean, we found that the, the, the randomized linear algebra literature, there are a throw of results that could be very interesting in a, in a quantum context, uh, both for quantum algorithms and for studying uh, quantum systems. And, uh, and uh, well, I think there is definitely scope for for more results coming out of, of that area. So the last part that, unfortunately, I, I think I won't have time to cover, and uh, is about uh, um, trying to use neural networks uh, to compress quantum states. Uh, I'll only give you the introductory slide, so I can just give you a bit of context, but I won't go through the, um, through the, through the actual results. Uh, but I think it's interesting to keep in mind what is going on in that area because it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's really booming and they have very interesting results and it's definitely more physics-y than computer science-y. And uh, this is a work with Ed Grant, UCL, Giuseppe at this newly founded Flatiron Institute in New York that uh, is investing massively in machine learning and quantum anybody. Uh, Sergei Strolchuk at the University of Cambridge and Simone at UCL. Um, so here again, we, we're starting from the problem of, um, uh, so there, I mean, there's basically the exponential scaling of the wave function means, me, makes many physical quantities untractable. We have quantum Monte Carlo, tensor networks, uh, exact diagonalization to tackle this sort of problems. And uh, each of these methods has, I mean, has, has its drawbacks, has advantages. And, uh, and the question is really, can we use machine learning to, um, to do something different. And um, what uh, Giuseppe Carleo and Matthias Stroyer did in 2017 was to use a, a restricted Boltzmann machine that is a type of uh, um, uh, generative neural network. Um, 
So this is a, is a type of machine learning method that uh, uses unlabeled data, so basically measurements on the state, and use these measurements to, um, um, to approximate uh, uh, the underlying probability distribution of the state in different bases, and, and, and so you're sort of doing uh, a type of tomography. And, uh, and so they showed that these RPNs can encode quantum states, and they had very good results for in a tomographic setting, and uh, for brown state estimation, for simple 1D, 1D models, that's also models that are exactly solvable, but they were able to beat uh, PEPs, uh, MPS, and, uh, and uh, many other nice things. So there is, a, I mean, growing interest in, in these techniques. And uh, what, what, we do, what we did in this space um, was trying to answer two open questions. Um, and the first one is, uh, are deeper networks better at learning quantum states? And, uh, and, I mean, there is this uh, growing, pretty much empirical classical literature, or literature in, on neural networks, uh, on general neural networks, that says that, yes, depth it, 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 it do it improves the representational capability of networks, but, uh, I mean, the theoretical results we have are, 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 are very limited, and, uh, and it's still not really clear why depth matters. And... Um, what we know in the quantum space is that uh, um, um, a deep version of this restricted Boltzmann machine, that is a model that is not, has only one layer, so it's not a deep model. So you can extend and make it, make restricted Boltzmann machine deeper. Um, well, they can efficiently represent any quantum state, and this is something that is not true for RBMs, but then you cannot really use these machines in practice. And, uh, and so we need a model that is also, that is deep, and efficiently, you can use it, you can, um, and you can efficiently use it. And uh, a third thing that we have is that um, um, shallow networks, uh, in some cases, have been proved to be more effective than deep networks. And, um, and uh, so I'll, I'll skip all this. So basically what we came up with, uh, I'll, I'll give you the spoiler slide, maybe it's interesting. So we came up with, uh, we used, um, uh, <clears throat> variational autoencoders, that is, so we introduced in the quantum space uh, uh, these models that uh, uh, are very deep, or you can make them very deep, and, uh, and you can also use them efficiently. So we introduced that, them in the quantum space, and we showed that that matters, and it also helps to learn uh, um, some, very, some types, of types of correlation that are very, that are very quantum. And uh, what was also interesting is, is that on states uh, that are provably hard to sample from, you were able to kind of compress them, so obtain some sort of uh, reduction in complexity. So I'll skip all these uh, slides and just uh, leave you with the conclusions, concluding remarks, uh, some general concluding remarks on machine learning and quantum physics. And uh, there is definitely much hype, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it's a rapidly moving field, definitely, and uh, sometimes the stuff that people came up with are surprisingly effective, so it's something that I think it's uh, interesting to keep in mind. Uh, there are there's, there's much empirical evidence, uh, and uh, this empirical evidence is not really explained, uh, so I think there are interest non-trivial problems that are posed. And, well, again, not much theory, so I think this is a huge opportunity for, for good theory to be made. And with that, I conclude. Thank you.